13. For the next 15 days, we were together for better or for worse. When we woke up, we decided to hitchhike to New York together. She was going to be my girl in town. I envisioned wild complexities with Dean and Marilou and everybody. A season, a new season. First, we had to work to earn enough money for the trip. Terry was all for starting at once with the $20 I had left. I didn't like it. And, like a damn fool, I considered the problem for two days. As we read the want ads of wild LA papers I'd never seen before in my life. In cafeterias and bars. Until my 20 dwindled to just over 10. We were very happy in our little hotel room. In the middle of the night, I got up because I couldn't sleep, pulled the cover over baby's bare brown shoulder, and examined the LA night. What brutal hot siren whining nights they are. Right across the street, there was trouble. An old rickety rundown rooming house was the scene of some kind of tragedy. The cruiser was pulled up below, and the cops were questioning an old man with gray hair. Sobbings came from within. I could hear everything, together with the hum of my hotel neon. I never felt sadder in my life. LA is the loneliest and most brutal of American cities. New York gets god-awful cold in the winter, but there's a feeling of wacky comradeship somewhere in some streets. LA is a jungle. At South Main Street, where Terry and I took strolls with hot dogs, was a fantastic carnival of lights and wildness. Booted cops frisked people on practically every corner. The beatest characters in the country swarmed on the sidewalks, all of it under those soft Southern California stars that are lost in the brown halo of the huge desert encampment LA really is. You could smell tea, weed, I mean marijuana, floating in the air together with the chili beans and beer. That grand wild sound of bop floated from beer parlors. It mixed medleys with every kind of cowboy and boogie woogie in the American night. Everybody looked like hassle. Wild negroes with bop caps and goatees came laughing by. Then long haired broken down hipsters straight off route 66 from New York. Then old desert rats carrying packs and heading for a park bench at the plaza. Then Methodist ministers with raveled sleeves and an occasional nature boy sane in beard and sandals. I wanted to meet them all talk to everybody but terry and i were too busy trying to get a buck together and we went to hollywood to try to work in the drugstore at sunset and vine now there was a corner great families off jalopies from the hinterland stood around the sidewalk gaping for sight of some movie star and the movie star never showed up when a limousine passed they rushed eagerly to the curb and ducked to look some character in dark glasses sat inside with a bejeweled blonde donna mechie donna mechie no, George Murphy, George Murphy. They milled around looking at one another. Handsome queer boys who had come to Hollywood to be cowboys walked around wetting their eyebrows with hinky fingertip. The most beautiful little gone gals in the world cut by in slacks. They came to be starlets. They ended up in drive-ins. Terry and I tried to find work at the drive-ins. It was no soap anywhere. Hollywood Boulevard was a great screaming frenzy of cars. There were minor accidents at least once a minute. Everybody was rushing off toward the farthest palm. And beyond that was the desert and nothingness. Hollywood Sam stood in front of swank restaurants, arguing exactly the same way Broadway Sam's argue at Jacobs Beach, New York. Only here they wore lightweight suits and their talk was cornier. Tall cadaverous preachers shuddered by. Fat screaming women ran across the boulevard to get in line for the quiz shows. I saw Jerry Colonna buying a car at Buick Motors. He was inside the vast plate glass window, fingering his mustachio. Terry and I ate in a cafeteria downtown, which was decorated to look like a grotto, with metal tits spurting everywhere and great impersonal stone buttockses belonging to deities and soapy Neptune. People ate lugubrious meals around the waterfalls, their faces green with marine sorrow. All the cops in LA look like handsome gigolos. Obviously, they come to LA to make the movies. Everybody had come to make the movies, even me. Terry and I were finally reduced to trying to get jobs on South Main Street among the beat countermen and dish girls who made no bones about their beatness. And even there, it was no go. We still had $10. Man, I'm gonna get my clothes from Sis and we'll hitchhike to New York, said Terry. Come on, man, let's do it. If you can't boogie, I know I'll show you how. That last part was a song of hers she kept singing. We hurried to her sister's house in the sliverous Mexican shack somewhere beyond Alameda Avenue. I waited in a dark alley behind Mexican kitchens because her sister wasn't supposed to see me. Dogs ran by, 
There were little lamps illuminating the little rat alleys. I could hear Terry and her sister arguing in the soft, warm night. I was ready for anything. Terry came out and led me by the hand to Central Avenue, which is the colored main drag of LA. And what a wild place it is, with chicken shacks barely big enough to house a jukebox, and the jukebox blowing nothing but blues, bop, and jump. We went up dirty tenement stairs and came to the room of Terry's friend, Margarina, who owed Terry a skirt and a pair of shoes. Margarina was a lovely mulatto. Her husband was black as spades and kindly. He went right out and bought a pint of whiskey to host me proper. I tried to pay part of it, but he said no. They had two little children. The kids bounced on the bed. It was their play place. They put their arms around me and looked at me with wonder. The wild humming night of Central Avenue, the night of Hamp's Central Avenue breakdown, howled and boomed along outside. They were singing in the halls, singing from their windows. Just hell be damned and look out. Terry got her clothes and we said goodbye. We went down to a chicken shack and played records on the jukebox. A couple of Negro characters whispered in my ear about tea. One buck, I said okay, bring it. The connection came in and motioned me to the cellar toilet, where I stood around dumbly as he said, Pick up, man, pick up. Pick up what? I said, Ev he had my dollar already. He was afraid to point at the floor. It was no floor, just basement, and there lay something that looked like a little brown turd. He was absurdly cautious. Gotta look out for myself, things ain't cool this past week. I picked up the turd, which was a brown paper cigarette, and went back to Terry, and off we went to the hotel room to get high. Nothing happened. It was Bull Durham tobacco. I wished I was wiser with my money. Terry and I had to decide absolutely and once and for all what to do. We decided to hitch to New York with our remaining money. She picked up $5 from her sister that night. We had about 13 or less. So before the daily room rent was due again, we packed up and took off on a red car to Arcadia, California, where Santa Anita Racetrack is located under snow-capped mountains. It was night. We were pointed toward the American continent. Holding hands, we walked several miles down the road to get out of the populated district. It was a Saturday night. We stood under a road lamp thumbing, when suddenly cars full of young kids roared by with streamers flying. Yeah, yeah, we won, we won! They all shouted. Then they yoo-hooed us and got great glee out of seeing a guy and a girl on the road. Dozens of such cars passed, full of young faces and throaty young voices, as the saying goes. I hated every one of them. Who did they think they were? Yawing at somebody on the road just because they were little high school punks and their parents carved the roast beef on Sunday afternoons? Who did they think they were making fun of a girl reduced to poor circumstances with a man who wanted to beloved? We were minding our own business, and we didn't get a blessed ride. We had to walk back to town, and worst of all, we needed coffee, and had the misfortune of going into the only place open, which was a high school soda fountain, and all the kids were there and remembered us. Now they saw that Terry was Mexican, a Pachuco wildcat, and that her boy was worse than that. With her pretty nose in the air, she cut out of there, and we wandered together in the dark up along the ditches of the highways. I carried the bags. We were breathing fogs in the cold night air. I finally decided to hide from the world one more night with her, and the morning be damned. We went into a motel court and bought a comfortable little suite for about $4. Shower, bath towels, wall radio, and all. We held each other tight. We had long, serious talks and took baths and discussed things with the light on and then with the light out. Something was being proved. I was convincing her of something, which she accepted. And we concluded the pact in the dark, breathless, then pleased, like little lamps. In the morning, we boldly struck out on our new plan. We were going to take a bus to Bakersfield and work picking grapes. After a few weeks of that, we were headed for New York in the proper way, by bus. It was a wonderful afternoon. Riding up to Bakersfield with Terry, we sat back, relaxed, talked, saw the countryside roll by, and didn't worry about a thing. We arrived in Bakersfield in late afternoon. The plan was to hit every fruit wholesaler in town. Terry said we could live in tents on the job. The thought of living in a tent and picking grapes in the cool California mornings hit me right. But there were no jobs to be had and much confusion, with everybody giving us innumerable tips and no job materialized. Nevertheless, we ate a Chinese dinner and set out with reinforced bodies. We went across the SP tracks to Mexican town. Terry jabbered with her brethren asking for jobs. It was night now, and the little Mextown street was one blazing bulb of lights. 
Movie marquees, fruit stands, penny arcades, five and tens, and hundreds of rickety trucks and mud spattered jalopies parked. Whole Mexican fruit picking families wandered around eating popcorn. Terry talked to everybody. I was beginning to despair. What I needed, what Terry needed too, was a drink. So we bought a quart of California port for 35 cents and went to the railroad yards to drink. We found a place where hobos had drawn up crates to sit over fires. We sat there and drank the wine. On our left were the freight cars, sad and sooty red beneath the moon. Straight ahead, the lights and airport pokers of Bakersfield proper. To our right, a tremendous aluminum Quonset warehouse. Ah, it was a fine night. A warm night, a wine drinking night, a moony night, and a night to hug your girl and talk and spit and be heaven going. This we did. She was a drinking little fool and kept up with me and passed me and went right on talking till midnight. We never budged from those crates. Occasionally bums passed, Mexican mothers passed with children, and the prowl car came by and the cop got out to leak. But most of the time we were alone and mixing up our souls ever more and ever more till it would be terribly hard to say goodbye. At midnight we got up and goofed toward the highway. Terry had a new idea. We would hitchhike to Sabinal, her hometown, and live in her brother's garage. Anything was alright with me. On the road, I made Terry sit down on my bag to make her look like a woman in distress. And right off, a truck stopped and we ran for it. All glee giggles. The man was a good man. His truck was poor. He roared and crawled on up the valley. We got to Sabinal in the wee hours before dawn.
I had finished the wine while Terry slept, and I was proper stoned. We got out and roamed the quiet leafy square of the little California town, a whistle stop on the SP. We went to find her brother's buddy, who would tell us where he was. Nobody home. As dawn began to break, I lay flat on my back in the lawn of the town square, and kept saying over and over again, You won't tell what he done up in weed, will you? what he do up in weed? You won't tell, will ya? what did he do up in weed? This was from the picture of Mice and Men, with Burgess Meredith talking to the foreman of the ranch. Terry giggled. Anything I did was alright with her. I could lie there and go on doing that till the ladies came out for church, and she wouldn't care. But finally I decided we'd be all set soon because of her brother, and I took her to an old hotel by the tracks, and we went to bed comfortably. In the bright sunny morning, Terry got up early and went to find her brother. I slept till noon. When I looked out the window, I suddenly saw an SP freight going by with the hundreds of hobos reclining on the flat cars and rolling merrily along with packs for pillows and funny papers before their noses, and some munching on good California grapes picked up by the siding. Damn, I yelled. Hooey, it is the promised land. They were all coming from Frisco. In a week, they'd all be going back in the same grand style. Terry arrived with her brother, his buddy, and her child. Her brother was a wild buck Mexican hot cat with a hunger for booze, a great good kid. His buddy was a big flabby Mexican who spoke English without much accent and was loud and overanxious to please. I could see he had eyes for Terry. Her little boy was Johnny, seven years old, dark-eyed and sweet. Well, there we were, and another wild day began. Her brother's name was Ricky. He had a 38 Chevy. We piled into that and took off for parts unknown. Where are we going? I asked. The buddy did the explaining. His name was Ponzo. That's what everybody called him. He stank. I found out why. His business was selling manure to farmers. He had a truck. Ricky always had three or four dollars in his pocket and was happy-go-lucky about things. He always said, That's right, man. There you go. There you go. There you go. And he went. He drove 70 miles an hour in the old heap, and we went to Madeira beyond Fresno to see some farmers about manure. Ricky had a bottle. Today we drink, tomorrow we work, there you go man, take a shot. Terry sat in back with her baby. I looked back at her and saw the flush of homecoming joy on her face. The beautiful green countryside of October in California reeled by madly. I was guts and juice again and ready to go. Where do we go now, man? We go find a farmer with some manure laying around. Tomorrow we drive back in the truck and pick it up. Man, we'll make a lot of money. Don't worry about nothing. We're all in this together, yelled Ponzo. I saw that was so. Everywhere I went, everybody was in it together. We raced through the crazy streets of Fresno and on up the valley to some farmers and back roads. Ponzo got out of the car and conducted confused conversations with old Mexican farmers. Nothing, of course, came of it. What we need is a drink, yelled Ricky, and off we went to a crossroads saloon. Americans are always drinking in crossroads saloons on Sunday afternoon. They bring their kids. They gabble and brawl over brews. Everything's fine. Come nightfall, the kids start crying and the parents are drunk. They go weaving back to the house. Everywhere in America, I've been in crossroads, saloons drinking with dull, whole families. The kids eat popcorn and chips and play in back. This we did. Ricky and I and Ponzo and Terry sat drinking and shouting with the music. Little baby Johnny goofed with other children around the jukebox. The sun began to get red. Nothing had been accomplished. What was there to accomplish? Mariana said Ricky. Manana man, we make it. Have another beer man, there you go, there you go. We staggered out and got in the car. Off we went to a highway bar. Ponzo was a big, loud, vociferous type who knew everybody in San Joaquin Valley. From the highway bar, I went with him alone in the car to find a farmer. Instead, we wound up in Madeira Mextown, digging the girls and trying to pick up a few for him and Ricky. And then, as purple dust descended over the grape country, I found myself sitting dumbly in the car as he argued with some old Mexican at the kitchen door about the price of a watermelon the old man grew in the backyard. We got the watermelon, we ate it on the spot, and threw the runs on the old man's dirt sidewalk. All kinds of pretty little girls were cutting down the darkening street. I said, where in the hell are we? Don't worry, man, said Big Ponzo. Tomorrow we make a lot of money, tonight we don't worry. We went back and picked up Terry and her brother and the kid and drove to Fresno in the highway lights of night. We were all raving hungry. 
We bounced over the railroad tracks in Fresno and hit the wild streets of Fresno Mextown. Strange Chinese hung out of windows, digging the Sunday night streets. Groups of Mex chicks swaggered around in slacks. Mambo blasted from jukeboxes. The lights were festooned around like Halloween. We went into a Mexican restaurant and had tacos and mashed pinto beans rolled in tortillas. It was delicious. I whipped out my last shining $5 bill, which stood between me and the New Jersey Shore, and paid for Terry and me. Now I had four bucks. Terry and I looked at each other. Where are we gonna sleep tonight, baby? I don't know. Ricky was drunk. Now all he was saying was, Da you go, man, da you go, man, in a tender and tired voice. It had been a long day. None of us knew what was going on, or what the good lord appointed. Poor little Johnny fell asleep on my arm. We drove back to Savinal. On the way, we pulled up sharp at a roadhouse on Highway 99. Ricky wanted one last beer. In back of the roadhouse were trailers and tents and a few rickety motel-style rooms. I inquired about the price, and it was two bucks. I asked Terry how about it, and she said fine because we had the kid on our hands now, and had to make him comfortable. So after a few beers in the saloon, where Sullenokies reeled to the music of a cowboy band, Terry and I and Johnny went into a motel room and got ready to hit the sack. Ponzo kept hanging around. He had no place to sleep. Ricky slept at his father's house in the vineyard shack. Where do you live, Ponzo? I asked. Nowhere, man. I'm supposed to live with Big Rosie, but she threw me out last night. I'm gonna get my truck and sleep in it tonight. Guitars tinkled. Terry and I gazed at the stars together and kissed. Manana, she said. Everything will be alright tomorrow, don't you think, Salhoni man? Sure, baby, manana. It was always manana. For the next week, that was all I heard. Manana, a lovely word and one that probably means heaven. Little Johnny jumped in bed, clothes and all, and went to sleep. Sand spilled out of his shoes. Madeira sand. Terry and I got up in the middle of the night and brushed the sand off the sheets. In the morning, I got up, washed, and took a walk around the place. We were five miles out of Sabinal in the cotton fields and grape vineyards. I asked the big fat woman who owned the camp if any of the tents were vacant. The cheapest one, a dollar a day, was vacant. I fished up a dollar and moved into it. There were a bed, a stove, and a cracked mirror hanging from a pole. It was delightful. I had to stoop to get in, and when I did, there was my baby and my baby boy. We waited for Ricky and Ponzo to arrive with the truck. They arrived with beer bottles and started to get drunk in the tent. How about the manure? Too late today. Tomorrow, man, we make a lot of money. Today we have a few beers. What do you say, beer? I didn't have to be prodded. Da, you go, da, you go, yelled Ricky. I began to see that our plans for making money with the manure truck would never materialize. The truck was parked outside the tent. It smelled like Ponzo. That night, Terry and I went to bed in the sweet night air beneath our dewy tent. I was just getting ready to go to sleep when she said, You wanna love me now? I said, What about Johnny? He don't mind, he's asleep. But Johnny wasn't asleep and he said nothing. The boys came back the next day with the manure truck and drove off to find whiskey. They came back and had a big time in the tent. That night, Ponzo said it was too cold and slept on the ground in our tent, wrapped in a big tarpaulin smelling of cow flaps. Terry hated him. She said he hung around with her brother in order to get close to her. Nothing was gonna happen except starvation for Terry and me. So in the morning, I walked around the countryside asking for cotton picking work. Everybody told me to go to the farm across the highway from the camp. I went and the farmer was in the kitchen with his women. He came out, listened to my story, and warned me he was paying only $3 per 100 pounds of picked cotton. I pictured myself picking at least 300 pounds a day and took the job. He fished out some long canvas bags from the barn and told me the picking started at dawn. I rushed back to Terry, all glee. On the way, a grape truck went over a bump in the road and threw off great bunches of grapes on the hot tar. I picked them up and took them home. Terry was glad. Johnny and me will come with you and help. Pshaw, I said. No such thing. You see, you see, it's very hard picking cotton. I show you out. We ate the grapes, and in the evening Ricky showed up with a loaf of bread and a pound of Hamburg, and we had a picnic. In a larger tent next to ours lived a whole family of oaky cotton pickers. The grandfather sat in a chair all day long. He was too old to work. The son and daughter and their children followed every dawn across the highway to my farmer's field and went to work. At dawn the next day, I went with them. 
They said the cotton was heavier at dawn because of the dew, and you can make more money than in the afternoon. Nevertheless, they worked all day from dawn to sundown. The grandfather had come from Nebraska during the Great Plague of the 30s, that self-same dust cloud my Montana cowboy had told me about, with the entire family in a jalopy truck. They had been in California ever since. They loved to work. In the 10 years, the old man's son had increased his children to the number of four some of whom were old enough now to pick cotton. And in that time, they had progressed from ragged poverty in Simon Legree fields to a kind of smiling respectability in better tents. And that Vassal, they were extremely proud of their tent. Ever going back to Nebraska? Pshaw, there's nothing back there. What we want to is buy a trailer. We bent down and began picking cotton. It was beautiful. Across the field were the tents, and beyond them the brown cotton fields that stretched out of sight to the brown arroyo foothills and then the snow-capped sierras in the morning air. This was so much better than washing dishes South Main Street, but I knew nothing about picking cotton. I spent too much time disengaging the white ball from crackly bed. The others did it in one flick. Moreover, fingertips began to bleed. I needed gloves or more experience. There was an old negro couple in the field with they picked cotton with the same God-blessed patience the grandfathers had practiced in antebellum Alabama. The moved right along their rows, Ben and Blue, and their bag increased. My back began to ache, but it was beautiful kneeling and hiding in that earth. If I felt like resting, I did, my face on the pillow of brown moist earth. Birds and accompaniment. I thought I had found my life's work. Johnny and Terry came waving at me across the field in hot lullo noon and pitched in with me. Be damned if Lit Johnny wasn't faster than I was. And of course, Terry twice as fast. They worked ahead of me and left me piles clean cotton to add to my bag. Terry workmen like pile, Johnny little childly piles. I stuck them in with sorrow. What kind of old man was I that couldn't support his ass, let alone theirs? They spent all afternoon with me. What if the sun got red we trudged back together? At the end of field, I unloaded my burden on a scale. It weighed 50 pound and I got a buck 50. Then I borrowed a bicycle from of the Oakey Boys and rode down 99 to a crossroads grocery store where I bought cans of cooked spaghetti and meatballs, bread, butter, coffee, and cake, and came back with the on the handlebars. Laybound traffic zoomed by, Frisco Boy harassed my tail. I swore and swore. I looked up at dark sky and prayed to God for a better break in life and better chance to do something for the little people I love. Nobody was paying any attention to me up there. I shot known better. It was Terry who brought my soul back. On the tent stove, she warmed up the food, and it was one of the greatest meals of my life. I was so hungry and tired. Sighing like an old Negro cotton picker, I reclined on the bed and smoked a cigarette. Dogs barked in the cool night. Ricky and Ponzo had given up calling in the evenings. I was satisfied with that. Terry curled up beside me, Johnny sat on my chest, and they drew pictures of animals in my notebook. The light of our tent burned on the frightful plain. The cowboy music twanged in the roadhouse and carried across the fields. All sadness. It was alright with me. I kissed my baby and we put out the lights. In the morning, the dew made the tent sack. I got up with my towel and toothbrush and went to the general motel toilet to wash. Then I came back, put on my pants, which were all torn from kneeling in the earth and had been sewed by Terry in the evening, put on my ragged straw hat, which had originally served as Johnny's toy hat, and went across the highway with my canvas cotton bag. Every day I earned approximately a dollar and a half. It was just enough to buy groceries in the evening on the bicycle. The days rolled by. I forgot all about the East and all about Dean and Carlo and the bloody road. Johnny and I played all the time. He liked me to throw him up in the air and down in the bed. Terry sat mending clothes. I was a man of the earth, precisely as I had dreamed I would be in Patterson. There was talk that Terry's husband was back in Sabinal and out for me. I was ready for him. One night, the Okies went mad in the roadhouse and tied a man to a tree and beat him to a pulp with sticks. I was asleep at the time and only heard about it. From then on, I carried a big stick with me in the tent in case they got the idea we Mexicans were fouling up their trailer camp. They thought I was a Mexican, of course, and in a way I am. But now it was October and getting much colder in the nights. The Oki family had a wood stove and planned to stay for the winter. We had nothing and besides the rent for the tent was due. Terry and I bitterly decided we'd have to leave. Go back to your family, I said. For God's sake, you can't be batting around tents with a baby like Johnny. The poor little tyke is cold.
Terry cried because I was criticizing her motherly instincts. I meant no such thing. When Ponzo came in the truck one gray afternoon, we decided to see her family about the situation. But I mustn't be seen and would have to hide in the vineyard. We started for Sabinal. The truck broke down and simultaneously, it started to rain wildly. We sat in the old truck, cursing. Ponzo got out and toiled in the rain. He was a good old guy after all. We promised each other one more big bat. Off we went to a rickety bar in Sabinal Mex town and spent an hour sopping up the brew. I was through with my chores in the cotton field. I could feel the pull of my own life calling me back. I shot my aunt a penny postcard across the land and asked for another 50. We drove to Terry's family's shack. It was situated on the old road that ran between the vineyards. It was dark when we got there. They left me off a quarter mile away and drove to the door. Light poured out of the door. Terry's six other brothers were playing their guitars and singing. The old man was drinking wine. I heard shouts and arguments above the singing. They called her a whore because she'd left her no good husband and gone to LA and left Johnny with them. The old man was yelling, but the sad fat brown mother prevailed, as she always does among the great fellahin peoples of the world, and Terry was allowed to come back home. The brothers began to sing gay songs fast. I huddled in the cold rainy wind and watched everything across the sad vineyards of October in the valley. My mind was filled with that great song, Lover Man, as Billie Holiday sings it. I had my own concert in the bushes. Someday we'll meet, and you'll dry all my tears, and whisper sweet little things in my ear, hugging and a-kissing. Oh, what we've been missing, Lover Man. Oh, where can you be? It's not the words so much as their great harmonic tune and the way Billy sings it, like a woman stroking her man's hair in soft lamplight. The winds howled. I got cold. Terry and Ponzo came back and we rattled off in the old truck to meet Ricky. Ricky was now living with Ponzo's woman, Big Rosie. We tooted the horn for him in rickety alleys. Big Rosie threw him out. Everything was collapsing. That night we slept in the truck. Terry held me tight, of course, and told me not to leave. She said she'd work picking grapes and make enough money for both of us. Meanwhile, I could live in Farmer Heffelfinger's barn down the road from her family. I'd have nothing to do but sit in the grass all day and eat grapes. You like that? Nah. In the morning, her cousins came to get us in another truck. I suddenly realized thousands of Mexicans all over the countryside knew about Terry and me and that it must have been a juicy romantic topic for them. The cousins were very polite and in fact charming. I stood on the truck, smiling pleasantries, talking about where we were in the war and what the pitch was. There were five cousins in all, and every one of them was nice. They seemed to belong to the side of Terry's family that didn't fuss off like her brother. But I loved that wild Ricky. He swore he was coming to New York to join me. I pictured him in New York, putting off everything till Manana. He was drunk in a field someplace that day. I got off the truck at the crossroads, and the cousins drove Terry home. They gave me the high sign from the front of the house. The father and mother weren't home, they were off picking grapes. So I had the run of the house for the afternoon. It was a four room shack. I couldn't imagine how the whole family managed to live in there. Flies flew over the sink. There were no screens, just like in the song. The window she is broken and the rain she is coming in. Terry was at home now and puttering around pots. Her two sisters giggled at me. The little children screamed in the road, and when the sun came out red through the clouds of my last valley afternoon, Terry led me to Farmer Heffelfinger's barn. Farmer Heffelfinger had a prosperous farm up the road. We put crates together, she brought blankets from the house, and I was all set except for a great hairy tarantula that lurked at the pinpoint top of the barn roof. Terry said it wouldn't harm me if I didn't bother it. I lay on my back and stared at it. I went out to the cemetery and climbed a tree. In the tree, I sang blue skies. Terry and Johnny sat in the grass. We had grapes. In California, you chew the juice out of grapes and spit the skin away. A real luxury. Nightfall came. Terry went home for supper and came to the barn at 9 o'clock with delicious tortillas and mashed beans. I lit a wood fire on the cement floor of the barn to make light. We made love on the crates. Terry got up and cut right back to the shack. Her father was yelling at her. I could hear him from the barn. She'd left me a cape to keep warm. I threw it over my shoulder and sculled through the moonlit vineyard to see what was going on. I crept to the end of a row and knelt in the warm dirt. Her five brothers were singing melodious songs in Spanish. The stars bent over the little roof. Smoke poked from the stovepipe chimney. I smelled mashed beans and chili. 
The old man growled. The brothers kept right on yodeling. The mother was silent. Johnny and the kids were giggling in the bedroom. A California home, I hid in the grapevines, digging it all. I felt like a million dollars. I was adventuring in the crazy American night. Terry came out, slamming the door behind her. I accosted her on the dark road. What's the matter? Oh, we fight all the time. He wants me to go to work tomorrow. He says he don't want me fooling around. Sally, I want to go to New York with you. But how? I don't know, honey. I'll miss you. I love you. But I have to leave. Yes, yes, we lay down one more time, then you leave. We went back to the barn. I made love to her under the tarantula. What was the tarantula doing? We slept a while on the crates as the fire died. She went back at midnight. Her father was drunk. I could hear him roaring. Then there was silence as he fell asleep. The stars folded over the sleeping countryside. In the morning, Farmer Heffelfinger stuck his head through the horse gate and said, How you doing, young fella? Fine. I hope it's alright me staying here. Sure thing. You going with that little Mexican floozy? She's a very nice girl. Very pretty, too. I think the bull jumped the fence. She's got blue eyes. We talked about his farm. Terry brought my breakfast. I had my canvas bag all packed and ready to go to New York as soon as I picked up my money in Sabinal. I knew it was waiting there for me by now. I told Terry I was leaving. She had been thinking about it all night and was resigned to it. Emotionlessly, she kissed me in the vineyard and walked off down the row. We turned at a dozen paces, for love is a duel, and looked at each other for the last time. See you in New York, Terry, I said. She was supposed to drive to New York in a month with her brother, but we both knew she wouldn't make it. At 100 feet, I turned to look at her. She just walked on back to the shack, carrying my breakfast plate in one hand. I bowed my head and watched her. Well, Akadaddy, I was on the road again. I walked down the highway to Sabinal, eating black walnuts from the walnut tree. I went on the SP tracks and bounced along the rail. I passed a water tower and a factory. This was the end of something. I went to the telegraph office of the railroad for my money order from New York. It was closed. I swore and sat on the steps to wait. The ticket master got back and invited me in. The money was in. My aunt had saved my lazy butt again. Who's going to win the World Series next year? Said the gone old ticket master. I suddenly realized it was fall and that I was going back to New York. I walked along the tracks in the long sad October light of the valley hoping for an SP freight to come along so I could join the grape-eating hobos and read the funnies with them. It didn't come. I got out on the highway and hitched a ride at once. It was the fastest, whoopingest ride of my life. The driver was a fiddler for a California cowboy band. He had a brand new car and drove 80 miles an hour. I don't drink when I drive, he said and handed me a pint. I took a drink and offered him one. What the hail, he said and drank. We made Sabino to LA in the amazing time of four hours flat, about 250 miles. He dropped me off right in front of Columbia Pictures in Hollywood. I was just in time to run in and pick up my rejected original. Then I bought my bus ticket to Pittsburgh. I didn't have enough money to go all the way to New York. I figured to worry about that when I got to Pittsburgh. With the bus leaving at 10, I had four hours to dig Hollywood alone. First, I bought a loaf of bread and salami and made myself 10 sandwiches to cross the country on. I had a dollar left. I sat on the low cement wall in back of a Hollywood parking lot and made the sandwiches. As I labored at this absurd task, great click lights of a Hollywood premiere stabbed in the sky. That humming West Coast sky. All around me were the noises of the crazy Gold Coast city. And this was my Hollywood career. This was my last night in Hollywood and I was spreading mustard on my lap in back of a parking lot john. 